Welcome to our quarterly innovation show for the second quarter of 2020. I'm Paul Comfort, and this is Transit Unplugged. Each quarter, every three months, we like to bring you an in-depth look at some new technology or new innovation that's impacting the public transit industry. And today is no different. We're bringing you a great in-depth interview with one of the leaders of transit technology in the world, and that is Josipa Petrinich. She is Executive Director and CEO of the Canadian Urban Transit Research and Innovation Consortium, known as QTRIC. And they are an industry-led organization where folks are working in the integrated mobility sectors in pursuit of collaborative research, development, and demonstration projects with academia. It's a great organization, and today we talk about uh, zero-emission buses, electrification, optimization of those, some big reports that they have coming out, which will help folks on how to use autonomous vehicles as well, how to use them better, and how to get folks back in public transit. Yosipa is a passionate advocate for public transit. Such an honor to have her here as part of our program. I think you're really going to enjoy this special edition of Transit Unplugged, our once a quarter uh, innovation show, where we bring you, again, an in-depth look at, at a big topic. And the big topic here is really zero emission buses, AVs, and how we get people back on transit after the pandemic. All that on this special edition of Transit Unplugged. What does it mean to be a successful public transit agency? What are you doing to lead the way? It's time to learn from the top transit professionals in North America. This is Transit Unplugged with your host, Paul Comfort. Welcome to Transit Unplugged. I'm your host, Paul Comfort. Thanks so much for being with us on the world's number one public transportation podcast. And today we have with us Josipa Petrinich, who's president and CEO of the Canadian Urban Transit Research and Innovation Consortium, known as QTRIC. Thanks so much for being with us today on the show. Thanks for having me. Yep. So uh, we've talked a couple times lately, and the things you've had to say are just phenomenal. And I wanted to have an opportunity to do a longer in-depth interview with you to talk about what QTRIC is working on and how it can impact a public transit industry, not just in Canada, but really around the world. Some of the things you're working on are really, uh, in my opinion, global leading practices. So first off, why don't you just tell us just for a minute about your organization so people kind of know what it is. And then I'd like to talk to you about yourself and how you ended up there and those kind of things. Sure. So QTRIC stands for the Canadian Urban Transit Research and Innovation Consortium. It's a very long name. Although recently we've been joking about it being the California Urban Transit Research and Innovation Consortium because we've been doing a whole lot of work down in California. And the issues are the same across the border in any case. What we focus on is really making North America a leader in low carbon smart mobility technology innovation. And not just deploying those technologies like electric buses and energy storage and smart charging controls, but also creating the jobs locally in those areas area. So not everything is imported so that a lot of the technology is domestically designed. And that's to make sure that as we all recover in this post-COVID economy and even before COVID so that we build a 21st century economy, we're actually creating those jobs in those sectors in our own local jurisdictions. So that's what QTRIC does. Pretty much everything we do is technology innovation. So although sometimes people think we're a transit association, we're not. We really lean on APTA and OPTA and ATUG and CUDA to do that kind of stuff. What we do is technology projects with transit as our champion demonstrators and prototype uh, developers. Very good. Tell us about yourself a little bit, your background and how you ended up at QTRIC and your role in actually getting it going. Yeah, sure. Well, some long circuitous story. I'll save you that. But essentially, I mean, my background was in the history of thermodynamics and mathematics. So the 19th century was all about shipping and shipping was the rage. And then I morphed that into automotive innovation for a long time, worked in the automotive sector in terms of electrified vehicle innovation. That was 20th century. And then I modernized into the 21st century. And and truth be told, the 21st century is about mass transit innovation. So if it was shipping in the 19th and automotive in the 20th, it is transit and mass mobility in the 20th first. QTRIC started five years ago. I'm the founding CEO and president. It was an organization that was an idea created by the Canadian Urban Transit Association. And it was members in that industry association, the transit association, that got together and thought, hmm, you know what, in Canada, at least, there's a lot of money that goes into the automotive sector in terms of innovation. And the same as in the United States. I mean, a lot of Recovery Act dollars at the time in 2009, 2010, went into Michigan and the automotive sector to innovate. And then there's rail innovation, somewhat. There's aerospace innovation. There's pharmaceutical innovation consortia. And government backs all of these things. But no 
nobody does transit innovation. And so the idea came out of a core group of leaders in the CUDA Association deciding to create a seed financing loan. They created a $70,000 loan. And the idea of Qtrick was created, and I was recruited to start it up as a startup tech company, and the rest is history. So we took that $70,000 loan, and we had no members and no projects and no concepts and no ideas, but a group of five people willing to volunteer on the board uh, and myself. And we're now over $2 million organization. We've launched over $50 million worth of projects. We have over 100 members, including core transit agencies and industry and academic partners, and we keep going, and we've just passed five years. Tell us a little bit more about the organization itself before we get into what you're doing. So it is a combination of what academia, operations, research, te- you know, kind of give us yeah, a little bit sure. more. So basically, we have a couple core sectors of members, and we are a membership-led nonprofit, but truth be told, we do operate like a technology innovation startup. Um, We've adopted that culture. So we have members from the transit sector, members like TransLink and TTC that sit on our board of directors across Canada. And now we have a couple members in California, like Orange County and Riverside Transit are our members as well. And then we have industry partners. So the Bombardiers and the ABBs and the Siemens and New Flyer, Novabus and Proterra, they're all our members, plus a bunch of small to mid-sized enterprises that are innovators in these fields and some of the data analytics companies like Init and so on. Then we have a core group of universities who do research in transit innovation or who want to do research in transit innovation. We have a core group of utilities now as well. So BC Hydro, Manitoba Hydro, Ontario Power Generation, all the utilities that, you know, frankly, are going to be the fuel providers of the future and already are, regardless of whether they have a strategy for it or not. So those are our core membership groups. And then we have some government, but we're primarily privately led in the sense that the bulk of our revenues come from membership fees or fee-for-service consulting work we do or policy work we do, the research work we do, and demonstration projects that we design and manage. We get a little bit of money from government on certain projects, but the whole idea around Qtrick is that we should be industry-led primarily so that come what may ideologically in political spheres, we don't arise and then disappear based on the hue of the political party in power. And that has really given us resilience because we've grown over a period of conservative government, liberal government, new democratic governments, a socialist government in different jurisdictions in this country over the last five and a half years. And, and that resiliency has allowed us to create projects that have longevity and don't disappear when the agenda of the governing party of the day gets voted out by electors. So tell me about some of the projects that you've worked on that you're most proud of over the last five years, and then we'll get into what's upcoming. Absolutely. So there's three big projects we're super proud of and a fourth one looming that I hope to come back in a year from now to say this is a global first and we did it. So the first big project is our Pan-Canadian Electric Bus Project. And that is a project that helped to publish the J3105 SAE standard for high power overhead charging systems for opportunity chargers. And four or five years ago, you might recall, I mean, most people were opposed in the transit agency world to on-route charging. There was a real commitment to the idea of depot-only charging But even within that, there wasn't standardization. Not everybody was using J1772. It wasn't plug and play models. If you bought a Proterra, you used Proterra charging. You bought a new flyer, you used a new flyer charging system. So there was a lack of standardization. And therefore, four years ago, four and a half years ago, we started this Pan-Canadian Electric Bus Project on the idea that we could put together Vancouver and TransLink and Brampton in North Toronto and York Region, North Toronto, and that they would deploy what ended up being 18 electric buses and seven overhead chargers designed by different manufacturers, but redesigned to be interoperable. And so that was a bit of a hard play. A lot of manufacturers didn't want to participate at the time. They were making sales off proprietary solutions. And so at least we had some step forward. We had New Flyer and Novabus, ABB and Siemens. They stepped forward and said, okay, look, if you get to a certain number of units in this project, then it will offset the cost of us redesigning our systems to a standard that we're still not sure everybody will adopt. And so we did a bit of a quid pro quo, shall we say, in terms of getting to the right number of units across three cities with OEMs willing to redesign and take on the risk of doing that and being the first to do that. It paid off massively. We started using the off-charge protocol from Europe, which is what existed for overhead charging. Most of that has been morphed into the J3105 standard. And now in Vancouver, in York Region and in Brampton, you have more than a dozen buses designed by Nova Bus and New Flyer running through overhead charging systems on the same route designed by ABB and Siemens in a plug-and-play interoperable model. That was a world first, and we're super proud of that. 
the next instantiation of that, though, is beyond standardization, optimization. What we've now learned, that eBus project has led us to the need for a massive joint procurement nationally, where the joint procurement is not just about getting the price of the buses lower. It's also about designing and optimizing the deployment of those buses and chargers. So it's not enough to have buses and chargers. You have to have them charging at the right moment in time, at the right power level for just enough energy. And you might even have to redesign all your routes and your deadheading and your pull-in and your pull-out in your garage. So now we're focused on the next big deployment, which we're hoping will be dozens and dozens of buses and chargers with energy storage devices, with facility redesign, interoperable plug and play models on optimized blocks or runs. So the data redesign of the routes to get the maximum amount of efficiency out of that electron or the hydrogen molecule. So that's our next big play. Uh, and therefore, it leads to the joint procurement initiative that we've been leading for the last year for electric bus and hydrogen fuel cell buses across Canada. The second big project that we've launched is something called the National Smart Vehicle Project. It is, we haven't yet launched it. It's been four years of design, design, design. And if you ask me what's the hardest part, I would have said the engineering. Ix that because the engineering comes, put enough minds on it and you solve the problem. The biggest problem now is the politics of urban design. So this is a project where it's first kilometer, last kilometer or first mile, last mile in our for our American colleagues. And it's really about overcoming that last mile gap to the transit hub. And we all know that there's great shuttles out there from Easy Mile and Navia and to get there in a Rugo, they don't necessarily interoperate. So we have the interoperability issue in terms of their communication platform. But on top of it, nothing is SAE level five ready in terms of autonomy. Nothing is ready to go out there and mix traffic under any conditions, any circumstances to navigate the world as a first mile, last mile solution. So the solution is really to create level four urban design, restricted laneways, basically extended bicycle lanes for autonomous shuttles that can be on demand, automated, connected, add a supplement to a transit bus fleet already, or deliver routes that wouldn't have buses allocated to them anyhow. So the smart vehicle project we have is one where we've been working with Easy Mile and Navia and to get there, which is a European shuttle maker, to see if we can get about 30 of these shuttles out on five to six, out in five to six cities in Canada, operating on first kilometer, last kilometer routes where they are not competing with buses because there will never be a bus on that route. It's too short. But because that lack of busing exists, people don't walk it. They don't jog it. They don't cycle it. They get in a car and drive. So that project we are working on right now. And as I said, the technology, the manufacturers have been great in terms of trying to interoperate, try to redesign to make an easy solution for cities. The challenge cities are facing are right now, they have to create dedicated laneways. And everybody wants that SAE level five full autonomy. And there's no reason to wait for that. We can get to a lot better mobility today if we allow for autonomous vehicles at an SAE level four. The third big initiative we're doing, which is the big one that I'm hoping to come back to you next year about, is our ACES Big Data Trust. So from this effort to do electric buses nationally and smart vehicles, we realized, well, okay, culturally, transit in North America doesn't collect, analyze, and in real time distribute a lot of its data. There's a lot of data being collected. There's a lot more telemetry today than there was 10 years ago, but it's not being collected into a platform and it's not being shared across cities. And so the taxpayers in lots of cities are repeating the same errors in procurement or the same inefficiencies because they can't look into each other's units. And we realized how powerful would it be if we had loggers on every bus, every charger, every fueling station, every autonomous shuttle, and all of that data went into a shared platform that cities could log into and see in real time how these units are operating in their neighboring cities. So that ACES Big Data Trust that creates that platform is what we're working on right now. And it's called ACES because it stands for Automated, Connected, Electrified, and Shared. Every type of vehicle that might come into a mobility network being logged in real time so the taxpayer can see how they are performing. And frankly, so that manufacturers can also see how their units are performing in real time in multiple cities to improve their products. Those are the big initiatives we're launching. So they're all very tech heavy. Yeah, that's amazing. And you've got a big conference coming up. So this episode of Transit Unplugged will be our mid-June episode. It also will serve as our once a quarter, we do an innovation show. And uh, so you're clearly, our first quarter innovation show was on zero emission buses. I think I talked about that before. We had Ryan Popple from Proterra on there. We had folks talking about electric buses, about CNG buses. We had Gary Thomas on from Dallas. And then we had um, my friend Lauren Skyver on from uh, Sunline Transit talking about hydrogen buses. And so this is our second quarter innovation show. And 
really it's the full spectrum in addition how you're working in all kinds of innovative ways, including with autonomous vehicles, which I think is amazing. And so you do, is this a once a year conference you do coming up? And tell us a little about that and when it will be held and all that. Yeah, so it is once a year and it's our fourth conference and we've been growing every year, but we call it our second Canadian Technology Conference because we focused last year on zero emissions buses and autonomous shuttles for first kilometer, last kilometer. And so it is going to be now our annual conference. Our goal is to be the place to go for everything you need to know in North America about electrified buses, automated buses, and automated electrified shuttles. Uh, That is the core focus point. We don't do a lot of general transit policy. We don't do a lot of general transit operations. We do technology and zero emissions bus and smart shuttles for first kilometer, last kilometer. It's coming up June 17th to 19th. Uh, And as I mentioned to you a while ago, Paul, we had it originally scheduled for Winnipeg. And why Winnipeg? Uh, It was in Winnipeg last year and we were planning to do it in Winnipeg every year henceforth because it is the great meeting place of all Canadians. You can get there in two hours by airplane and Canada's a large country as is the United States. So it's right smack dab in the middle of the continent effectively, at least on the northern end. This year, of course, we can't do it in Winnipeg and so we went virtual and we decided to make it virtual because we're an innovation consortium. So of course we have to virtualize and I have to say it's been a big success. Now it's been a learning curve on our end. And I will ask for your listeners, if they do end up registering and attending, which I really strongly encourage you to do, we've got over 80 speakers, over 30 panels, all on electric bus and autonomous shuttle and big data around that. If you do join, and if there are glitches, bear with us. It's the first time that we've done a massive virtual conference, and we turned it around in a matter of a couple weeks. So there's lots of things we'd like to be able to do that we can't do in June, but we're going to do it in a second round of the conference, possibly later this year on rail innovation. Things like virtual tours using 3D glasses that we mail out to people. Fun things you can do in a virtual platform you can't necessarily do or wouldn't do in an in-person. But this year in June, I have to say the content is stellar. And the participation right now, registrants are logging in from Asia, from Europe, from South America, from the United States, and from across Canada. I don't think we would have gotten this level or this caliber of participation Politicians are lining up, so we're going to be announcing those next week. We have more mayors and ministers lined up to speak at this conference than ever before. So the virtual platform has given us a really great opportunity to diversify the voices at the table around transit mobility and to internationalize the participation for best practices. That's great. And if people wanted to find out more or register, where would they go? The easiest way is actually just to Google our name, Qtrick, because our, it'll come up, but it's wwwqtrick critique which is the French acronym, .org. But if you just Google our name, the website will come up and it'll take you right to the conference website. Great. All the information's there about how to log in, cost and all that stuff. That's right. We've been able to really reduce the cost because you're doing it on a virtual platform for evident reasons. But I have to say also to folks, I believe that this gives us a platform for diversifying the participants. So I truly believe, I mean, there is a gender issue in transit. We know that the vast majority of decision makers in transit are men and the vast majority of, not the vast, but the majority of riders are women. Uh, That is certainly the case in Canada. And I suspect the stats are the same in the United States. So we've had this ongoing issue with women getting access to the highest end technology to make it up the ranks in the transit world. And because it's a virtual platform and we know that women are pulling double duty at home with their careers and managing kids, we believe, I certainly believe that this is going to give women, a lot of women, the chance to participate in high-end technology that they might not be able to do uh, sociologically or economically or professionally. So we're very much hoping, not just on a gendered aspect, but also a lower socioeconomic aspect. Maybe you're not at the level in your career where you can afford a $600 conference or you wouldn't get the permission from your boss to attend it, but you can now attend this conference at $100 or $200, or if you're a student, 50 bucks roughly, to attend something that's going to give you more knowledge than you could have gotten in a year of studying. So we really believe that this is going to start this platform rebalancing and at least diversifying the voices at the table and mobility. That's great. Thank you, by the way, for the invitation to moderate one of the panels. I look forward to it. We look forward to having you because I think one of the big things we're going to ask people to be patient with us on is we've got some great moderators, but not everybody is as used to moderating in a virtual platform with 10,000 buttons and ding-dongs that you're not quite sure what they do. So if our moderators go off track a little bit, no worries. We'll move on and it'll be okay. We just ask for a little bit of patience as we all work through this virtual platform. Yeah, you know, it is funny that 
I guess it's the old, you know, adage that you can turn a crisis into an opportunity and, you know, the whole coronavirus crisis. But there has been a lot of opportunities to do things uniquely like this, like you said, having speakers from all over the world that you might not have been able to get to your conference. I know I've been able to do things pretty cool, like, you know, drop in virtually to the city of Richmond, British Columbia's staff meeting for their transportation department, you know, be their guest speaker. I probably never would have done that otherwise. Or in Washington, D.C., I did the same thing. And others have asked me to do that. And so we do need to, I think, take this opportunity. The analogy I've used recently is a storm brings up a lot of wind and the right birds know how to soar and use that wind to really be, it's a cliche, but to be the wind beneath your wings, you know? And during this time when there's a lot of storming going on, I think if you are creative and take the opportunities that are there, you can soar and get lots of more opportunities. I've I've got friends in lots of different businesses. Some of them have been hurting because their businesses have been, you know, they haven't had all the same opportunities, but they've still figured out a way to soar and to take opportunities. And so I think you've done a great job yourself by doing this with your conference. Well, I'll have to say, I mean, I'm a fan of Bette Midler. So wind beneath our wings, I I agree. Uh, And on that, you know, two items around that. One is we are in a transit sector that is attempting to save the climate. Nobody goes into transit wanting to pollute the world. You go into transit wanting to get more people into shared mobility, get them out of their cars, make communities more mobile. So shouldn't we be doing virtual conferences anyhow? Because should we really be flying around the continents in aircraft, trying to get to conferences where we learn how to save the environment? Maybe this is a wake-up call to our industry too, that it's not totally acceptable anymore to have mass gatherings all the time that are energy intense. Maybe there is a bit of a wake-up call to the idea of doing more knowledge sharing in a less polluting way. I mean, this is the industry we live and breathe. Perhaps that's a lesson to all of us. I mean, I go to the extreme. I think that CEOs of transit shouldn't have parking spots. I think that is something that if you're the head of transit, you should not have a parking spot. But even just from a conferencing standpoint, a lot of GHGs are created as greenhouse gases just by getting to knowledge sharing platforms. And maybe this is an opportunity for the wind under our winds to lift us a little bit higher. The second thing I'd add to that is, at least in in Canada, and I also believe in many states in the United States, especially California, climate action is not going anywhere. You know, so folks have said, uh, well, cities are bankrupt right now. Municipalities don't have money. Nobody's on the buses. There's no revenue. Yeah, but most governments, including Canadian and European governments, are not going anywhere on climate action. The kind of recovery money that's about to come out is for green infrastructure, green buses, integration of hydrogen economy. So we have to prepare our industry to absorb that investment and actually deploy it effectively. And everybody's canceled their conferences. So where is the knowledge going to be disseminated exactly if we don't get onto virtual platforms? We don't start learning through this new mechanism. We're going to end up with policy and expenditures in three to four months time meant to stimulate an economy where people will be without the knowledge they need in order to invest it in the right kinds of procurements and deployments. So I think more than just converting our conference to a virtual platform and trying a new mechanism, we're trying to actually live the dream of transit and anti-pollution, but we're also trying to make sure that decision makers and government have the knowledge they need to disseminate green infrastructure dollars in an effective way that does actually create jobs and saves the economy. I love how passionate you are about what you do. It's great. It allows me to be a little less passionate because I'm I'm usually very intense when I speak, but you're carrying that for the conversation, so it's great. You're my yin to yang, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. So uh, tell us some about, you've got a couple cool reports coming out. Tell us yeah. about the, the new reports. And then I want to talk about, you know, electrification and data optimization. Sure. So, I mean, one of the things, you know, like any organization, any small startup, you go through a SWOT analysis and try and figure out what do you not do well that you should do well. And one thing that I really do well is uh, communicate in the sense of social media and putting our information out there. And one of the things we learned from our SWOT analysis this year was, you know, Qtrick, my team, we collect a lot of knowledge, a lot of expert knowledge. I think there's probably no team that's better informed right now about electric optimization for transit applications than we are, but we weren't disseminating it. So if you were part of our project, you benefited from that knowledge. But if you were in the world out there, you didn't know all this hard work and all this knowledge learning. So we created the Qtrick white paper series. It's called the Knowledge Series. The first report was issued today. It is based on two years of intense cross-national research into the top 10 rail innovation projects in Canada, including among those top 10, a lot of hydrail or hydrogen rail applications for zero emission passenger and freight mobility, as well as artificial intelligence, light weighting and alternative propulsion systems overall. That report comes out today and it's meant to disseminate all this knowledge that we've been housing in-house around rail innovation, 
put it out in the world and start using it to help our governments decide where to invest money in rail and passenger mobility. In a couple weeks, in two weeks' time, we're going to be releasing our Natural Resources Canada Best Practices for Transit Electrification Report. That took a year to prepare. It's based on all of our best practices and knowledge. It's based on a lot of interviews, including some of your colleagues in the United States, including Sunline. Uh, Lauren was very helpful there, as were a number of other participants. What are the right things we're doing in transit electrification? And if you could do it all over again, what are the wrong things that happened that we wouldn't want to repeat if we could start from scratch? So that report's coming out in two weeks, and that's based on all of our knowledge from focus groups, surveys, and literature reviews, as well as case studies of utilities and transit agencies trying to go electric and doing well or facing some gaps. And then a third report's coming out in July based on two years of work into autonomous smart shuttles. And we did a whole bunch of modeling. If you do stick those shuttles on a bunch of your first kilometer, last kilometer routes, how far will they go before they run out of passengers? How many people can they move? How many do you need in an hour to even make it worth the while? Uh, And what kind of routes are off? optimal for the application of these kinds of vehicles. So we've got basically a report coming out every month or two months for the next year or so of our knowledge series. And it's an attempt to overcome the clear SWOT outcome that indicated we were not communicating well enough all this expert knowledge. So let me know in a year if you feel we've done a bit better than we've done in the past. And I hope that that knowledge can be absorbed to improve procurement and deployments. Hey, do you know what you've come up with on uh, autonomous, autonomous vehicles? So as what I saw, and I, you know, we've talked about this before, but you know, I was out there in Vegas and rode the first one there. I was in Switzerland and rode uh, Trapezio there, the first one in regular route service in the world. But most of them still have like a very compact uh, uh, number of routes they can travel and a very short, you know, like two mile, three mile distance. I know I had a friend in the middle part of the country that had one of the major manufacturers come down and he wanted to run it along a trail up to a football stadium. And they were like, oh, sorry, that's seven miles. We can't go that far. What's going on with that? And when can we get to the point where the brain on these things and the mapping capacity can allow them to be more robust in their ability to handle more than just a couple miles of memory? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, there are actually manufacturers already achieving that. One of our members is to get there. It's a, it's an interesting kind of name, but they're out of the Netherlands and they've actually been operating these shuttles for 20 years. So they're into their fourth generation. They have a number in the Middle East and in Europe, and these vehicles do go up to 50 to 60 kilometers an hour. They are driverless, they're connected, and they travel dozens of kilometers on the okay. They're basically mini buses that yeah. don't have drivers and are connected. What happened to make that work? When you take a look at the deployments in the Middle East and in Europe, where those shuttles are working, they are not low cost shuttles. And I think that's one of the challenges is that in the world of these autonomous small driverless shuttles, a lot of transit was hoping for a very, very, very cheap mobility pod where you don't have to buy a bus at $500,000 or $600,000. You could buy a small right. pod of 50000 or 100000 If you really want a good system with magnets, LIDAR, radar, GPS, camera systems, high safety, high speed, competitive with buses, but delivering services where buses can't necessarily, you need to be looking at millions of dollars as a deployment. It's a system deployment. So you're not going to get away with El Cheapo mechanism. You're going to have to go to a much more system robust mechanism, which means your savings will accrue from ridership and emission savings and operational savings, but you do need to redesign your system. And so when you look at the to get their shuttles and their best successes, they got cities to redesign streets. So they do have dedicated or semi-dedicated laneway. They have put these really swank pull-in pods. If you think about a transit terminal where buses pull in and they're very well organized into a transit terminal, think about the equivalent of that where the shuttle pulls in and it's automatically connected to its charging device and it's automatically connected to its departure and onboarding and it could be on demand and connected to users of the system. So you have to design a facility, a terminal with pull-in points with charging infrastructure and some dedicated laneway out on the road. If you're willing to do that kind of urban design work in the interest of transit, then these shuttles are ready to go tomorrow. The problem we have in North America, as you saw, I mean, not only in Las Vegas, we had the issue in Canada, left, right, and center. Lots of one-off pilots that went nowhere. So it was sexy and cool for a couple months, and then it went nowhere. And it was, as I considered, the trend period of 2016, 2017, 
followed by the hangover after the party and maybe the vomitorium in the middle where we all realized that these things weren't working the way we thought they should work. Well, we set them up to fail because we sh- set up shuttles and we expected manufacturers like Navi and EasyMail to prove to us in 2016 that they work under all conditions and all circumstances, SA level five autonomy. Why are we doing that? We don't need that. What we need is urban design that supports mass mobility. To get the urban design, the extended bicycle lanes for shuttles, the connectivity to the transit schedule so the shuttle's not showing up in the middle of no, nowhere at the time when there's nobody ready to use it. If you design those aspects, then you can get these higher speed shuttles out on the road tomorrow and you accept that they're SAE level four. You accept that they're connected and driverless within a defined parameter condition because you've accepted in your cities you're going to privilege transit over automobiles and mixed traffic, right? Without that philosophical move, the technology will never serve all of our needs under all conditions, at least not in the next couple of years. And that's why we're setting ourselves up for failure if that's what we start off trying to achieve. If we start off trying to achieve, you know, connected mobility and we're willing to design some streets around it, then we're going to have a whole heck of a lot more success. In our last remaining moments, I wanted to talk to you about how to get people back on transit. I know you've got some real opinions on that. Let's talk about that. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm really epically annoyed um, by the fact that transit has been pilloried in the news media and yes. in social media yeah. and culturally as though it's yep. the only place you go to pick up a virus or an epidemiological right. crisis of some sort unfolds on your 60 foot bus that could not right. theoretically unfold in any other clustering of humanity. Right. Uh, it is unfortunately a demonstration of the fact that we treat transit as the last option of last resort. We don't think of it as the middle class place that people want to go all the time over and above cars because it's just better for you and your life and your family. So here's how I contextualize it. You know, I've had colleagues say to me before, well, I'm not getting back on transit until there's a vaccine. What if there's no vaccine? Start there. What if there's no vaccine? And how about those of us like myself who don't own a car and I can't own a car because a parking spot is $60,000 in downtown Toronto. Why in the world I buy a car for a $60,000 parking spot when I go buy a mini house in the middle of outside Winnipeg? You know, why would we do these? So assume there's no vaccine. Assume you don't have the cash flow to support a car purchase. What are our options? Our options are to make transit better. And I believe that this is a wake-up call that transit should have been better to start with. I've said this before. Folks have said, well, can we ever go back to crush capacity? Why did we ever accept crush capacity to start with? Why was that acceptable that people should be shoved like sardines on their way to work or on their way to home or on the way to the daycare? That was never acceptable to start with unless we treated transit as the place of last resort. So we put out an issue call to our university partners, and we're going to be going very formal with with this at the conference and right after the conference, we are inviting project proposals from our university and college partners. And some industry groups have responded already saying, hey, we actually have a project we can do. Anything that will help get people back into transit through cultural studies, survey studies, information analytics, design, redesign of the interior, redesign of the exterior, and design of the communications protocols. Anything that's going to help you get back into transit, make you feel safe and secure, and that that is the place you want to go, as well as the policy studies around road pricing that motivates people to exit their cars. Um, And therefore, we're going to have a whole host of projects, but some of the ones that have been proposed already include things like seat design you know, angling the seats, seat pods, new seat materials. Some materials hold the viral load better than others. So look at new materials. If we can auto, if we can lightweight the whole automotive sector, I'm pretty sure we can figure out new materials for the interior design of our vehicles that meet our health standards. Airflow, opening the windows and creating new airflow mechanisms. I mean, the laws of thermodynamics have not changed. We have bright minds in the world of physics that can figure out ways to minimize dangerous airflow and maximize healthy airflow. And then the cultural studies. So everybody say nobody will go back to transit. Do you know that for a fact? Nobody has done a national survey right now that has asked people, what's your risk level? What would you need to get back into transit? Or what is the quid pro quo? What's the exchange you're willing to accept? If you showed up and you were given a free mask and a free bottle of hand sanitizer every day, is that enough to motivate you to get back in transit? For some people it is. If you got points Okay, I'm going to use a Canadian example, shopper's optimum points. Maybe in the U.S., I don't know, Dunkin' Donuts. Okay, if you got points, some kind of points for riding transit, you got some reward the same way you get air miles or air rewards. You got some kind of cash back for taking transit. What's your trigger? How much cash back do you need to get back into transit? 
Similarly, how much punitive measure in road pricing do you need to get out of your car? Those kinds of surveys have to happen. And right now we're just dealing in the world of qualitative case studies and anecdotes that do not add up to statistical representation. We have pillaring of transit in the news media and culturally, and then we have no statistics to demonstrate what people's triggers are to get back into the system. So we're trying to resolve that. Project partnerships in the next eight weeks, we're proposing it to the feds, a lot of survey work, and I'm getting back on my uh, soapbox around rewarding transit riders. This was something we tried to do pre-COVID. It's something we need to absolutely do now. Give people cash back. Give them some value for showing up to transit. Give them some control over their day in terms of demand management. Give them the apps that let them choose when they get onto transit and get a cash back reward for going outside of congestion periods. This can be managed. Our brains are intelligent. We have created a lot of innovation. The seven wonders of the world, our human brain is capable of computing and designing solutions to get people back into transit and not just back into the old transit, back into better transit than ever. Very good. Wow. You said it better than anybody. That was great, Josipa. I really appreciate you being with us today as a guest on Transit Unplugged. Josipa Petronich, Dr. Josipa Petronich, who <laughs> is uh, president and CEO of Qtric, and uh, we wish you much success. I look forward to continue to work with you and your organization going forward. Thanks so much, Paul. And we look forward to having you moderate one of our sessions at our conference. See you soon. You've been listening to Transit Unplugged, powered by Trapeze Group. To stay up to date, subscribe on iTunes or Google Play or join the conversation at transitunplugged.com. Thanks for listening.